Trekkies worldwide know that space is indeed the final frontier. One to be boldly explored by a species that wants to shake off the burdening shackles of mundane life on Earth dictated by those oh so draconian laws of gravity. As early as science and budgets would allow it, the greatest powers on our planet have fired their brains and engines to project our thirst for knowledge, for prestige, for power beyond orbit. For decades, this stellar exploration remained a privilege reserved for the Cold War era superpowers. Even today, oh, when thinking about the space race, one must exclusively conjure images of Soviet cosmonauts and star-spangled astronauts. Well, think again. For the right combination of scientific progress, national ambition, and careful budgeting practices have recently planted another flag in that realm of floating rocks and endless void, and that is India. This is the story of how India launched arguably the most ambitious but almost most surely the most cost-effective space program to date. India gained independence from the British Empire on August 15, 1947, and from the very start, its political leaders and scholarly elites realized the importance of science as an important factor for societal development and nation building. The ink on the Indian Independence Act had barely dried when Dr. Vikram Sarabhai founded the Physical Research Laboratory, or PRL, in Ahmedabad. With its focus on the study of cosmic rays, the PRL can be considered as the cradle of space research in India and Dr. Sarabhai as the father of the local space program. Throughout the 1950s, the PRL concentrated its research on space and atmospheric sciences, astronomy, astrophysics, and solar physics. During that same decade, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru pursued a non-aligned stance against the backdrop of the Cold War. Non-aligned was not the same as non-interested, however, and India observed carefully the achievements brought about by the space race between the US and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Sputnik program, in particular, inspired the PRL to form a committee on outer space research, COSPAR, and to request more more funding and support from the Department of Atomic Energy. In 1962, COSPAR became INCOSPAR, or Indian National Committee for Space Research, which may be considered as the first incarnation of India's space agency. Now, at that time, India was far from being a superpower. Hence, INCOSPAR raised many eyebrows before it could actually raise any rockets from the launch pads. How could a team of scientists, however prestigious, lobby a government into forming such an enterprise? According to Gurbir Singh, author of The Indian Space Program, India's Incredible journey from the third world towards the first, much of the merit can be ascribed to Dr. Sarabhai and his partners in scientific crime. Quoting him, Many successful Indian scientists of international repute were bright, gifted, and came from very successful industrial families. They had a lot of cash, and they also had contacts in high society. They knew the Prime Minister, so they were moving in the right circles. And I think that synergy helped to kickstart India in the direction it went. Critics of the program argued that India should focus on solving more pressing issues before looking to the stars. For example, in November 1962, India had just lost a border conflict against China, a defeat in no small part caused by a lack of military funding and inadequate logistics. Vikram Sarabhai himself argued that space research would play a critical role in nation building, national development, and scientific progress to the benefit of ordinary citizens. There are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. To us, there is no ambiguity of purpose. We do not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or the planets or and space flight, but we are convinced that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society. Dr. Zarabai's vision first became a roaring reality in 1963, with Inca Spa's first successful mission. This was the launch of an experimental sounding rocket, which took off from the Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station in Kerala. A sounding rocket is a suborbital craft designed to probe the upper atmospheric regions. In this case, the rocket from Thumba carried a small sodium capsule to be released at an altitude of 150 kilometers. The aim of the experiment was to observe the diffusion of the sodium payload from the ground. Six years later, August 15, 1963, Inca Spa was reorganized as ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. In 1962, ISRO became the research and development arm of the newly constituted Department of Space, or DOS, itself under the direct authority of the Prime Minister, at the time, Indira Gandhi. Back in August 1971, India and the Soviet Union had signed a treaty of peace, friendship, and cooperation, whose Article 6 was dedicated to consolidating and expanding, quote, mutually advantageous and comprehensive cooperation in the scientific and technological fields, a cooperation which benefited also ISRO's endeavors. In fact, on April the 19th, 1975, India's first satellite, Ayabata, was launched by a Soviet Cosmos 3M rocket from the Kapustin Yar Cosmodrome. This was an experimental craft which remained active until March 1981, orbiting Earth at a maximum distance of 619 kilometers. 
In 1979, ISRO made its first attempt to put a satellite in orbit with its own rocket, SLV-3E1, a mission which resulted in failure. But on July 18, 1980, SLV-3E2 successfully took off from Sriharakota, placing the Rohini satellite in low Earth orbit. Less than a year later, on June 19, 1981, India launched its first experimental communication satellite, entirely designed and constructed locally. This was the Apple, or Ariane Passenger Payload Experiment, the first of the Indian National Satellite Series, also known as INSAT. This consists of 14 operational satellites, one of the largest orbital communication systems in the Asia-Pacific area, fulfilling a variety of functions such as television broadcasting, telemedicine, meteorology, advanced disaster warning, and even satellite-aided search and rescue missions. In the late 1980s, ISR launched another series of crafts as part of the IRS program. Our friends in the US may associate a sinister ring to that letter acronym, but in this case, IRS stands for Indian Remote Sensing, indicating the acquisition of information at a distance. The IRS satellites have been used to conduct environmental analysis, cartography missions, as well as rural and urban development surveys. As of today, India can boast the largest fleet of remote sensing satellites catering to the needs of both local and global clients. And naturally, this amount of kit required ISRO to acquire or develop a matching fleet of launch vehicles. Up to the end of the 1980s, the Indian Space Agency and the Department of Space fulfilled the initial vision of Dr. Arabai of propelling technological development for national advancement and the benefit of the population, eschewing the logic of the space race raging between the two superpowers. But throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, after the USSR had collapsed and the Cold War had become just a plot device for nostalgic Hollywood flicks, India became embroiled in a space race of its own. Earth's orbit was no longer the ultimate frontier. India now aimed for the moon, and the rival to beat was the other Asian regional power, China. According to the already quoted Gurbir Singh, the moon mission and many other ISRO space programs have been influenced by similar programs in China. In 2003, China had its first human spaceflight success. In 2007, they sent a spacecraft to the moon. They have built their own space stations. So India has been following in China's footsteps, just like what happened in the Cold War between the US and Soviet Union. The rivalry with Beijing was the impetus for ISRO's first lunar mission, Chandrayaan Pratham, or Chandrayaan 1, Sanskrit for First Journey to the Moon. On October 22, 2008, a Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, rocketed off from the Sri Harakota Space Center carrying a moon impact probe as well as an orbiting craft. The probe and the orbiter were equipped with a video imaging system, a radar altimeter, and a mass spectrometer to analyze the lunar atmosphere. They also carried science instruments on behalf of NASA and the European Space Agency, the ESA. The impact probe landed on the moon's south pole on November 14, 2008, sparking off celebrations around the country. The accompanying satellite has since conducted 3,400 orbits of the moon, conducting a chemical, mineralogical, hydrological, and photogeologic mapping survey before communication was lost on August 29, 2009. During the first decade of this century, ISRO and the DSO also cooperated with the armed forces to develop India's military presence in space. In 2001, the joint agencies launched the Technology Experimental Satellite, India's first military application satellite. Since then, 14 orbital crafts have been fired into space to fulfill intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance duties, and especially to monitor troop movements on the disputed borders with Pakistan and China. Speaking of which, in 2011, a joint Russian-Chinese expedition to Phobos, one of the moons of Mars, failed. By his own admission, the then chairman of the ISRO, Dr. Rad Hakrishnan, took this Chinese failure as a prompt for the next endeavor, sending a craft to the Red Planet, or in Sanskrit, to Mangala. The official name of ISRO's Martian expedition was Mars Orbiter Mission, or MOM for short. But it's become better known by the name of the craft that they use, Mangalyan. The Mangalyan was scheduled to be launched in 2013 using a geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle rocket, the GLSV. This vector could have boosted the Mars craft out of our planet's orbit and directly towards its final destination, but it suffered two failures in 2010. This forced ISRO to make a difficult choice. Fixing the issues of the GSLV would have taken more than three years, pushing the launch date to 2016. But the space agency wanted to keep their original timeline, so they took a gamble and enlisted the services of the less powerful PSLV rocket. This would have placed Mangalyan only as far as highly elliptical Earth orbit, and from there, the Mars craft itself would have used its own engines, fired at precise points, to then shoot off toward the Red Planet. And the gamble played out. On November 5, 2013, the PLSV ferried the Mangalyan to the stars, and after some 300 days, the craft's 
successfully entered Mars's orbit on September the 23rd, 2014. The mission continued to operate for seven and a half years, collecting data on the Martian landscape and atmosphere through its payload of five scientific instruments. ISRO had become the fourth space agency to reach Mars after previous expeditions organized by NASA, ESA, and Roscosmos, its Russian counterpart. MON, Mars Orbiter Mission, became notable also for other organizational reasons. First, it marked a significant milestone in terms of gender equality within ISRO, as 27% of key positions were filled by women who took charge of major areas such as navigation, communication, control system, and spacecraft design. Second, it marked a record in terms of cost efficiency. Let's draw a comparison with NASA, shall we? On November the 18th, 2013, two weeks after Mangil Yan's launch, NASA's MAVEN mission lifted off from Cape Canaveral. The Vector's payload entered Mars's orbit on September the 22nd, 2014, one day before ISRO's satellite, and it's still in operation. The cost of the entire mission was $582.5 million, quite the sum, and actually the entire expenditure came under the forecasted budget. And now for the overall costs of ISRO's Mars Orbiter mission. This was approximately $73 million. That's an eighth of what NASA spent on a very similar thing. Not only that, $73 million is $35 million cheaper than the budget for Ridley Scott's 2015 blockbuster movie, The Martian. By the end of the decade, the Indian Department of Space had expanded its already ambitious program by firing into orbit dozens more satellites. But the jewels in their crown were two missions in 2019, which once again both met with triumph and were tinged by failure. First came Mission Shakti in March 2019, co-developed with the military. In fact, this consisted of testing an anti-satellite weapon against a previously launched target craft, the Microsat R. The test was a complete success, prompting Prime Minister Narendra Modi to describe his country as a military space power, saying, India has made an unprecedented achievement today. India registered its name as a space power. Not hiding that the test was motivated by reasons of national pride, Modi tweeted, In the journey of every nation, there are moments that bring utmost pride and have a historic impact on generations to come. India has successfully tested the anti-satellite missile. The second mission, more peaceful and arguably more exciting, was a second trip to the moon, Chandrayaan-2. This was a significant evolution of Chandrayaan-1. In addition to sending an orbiter around the moon, ISRO would place a landing craft and a rover on its southern pole. The aim was to conduct a detailed analysis of our natural satellite's topography, seismography, minerals, and surface composition, a complex study designed to understand the origins and evolution of the moon. The Chandrayaan-2 craft reached lunar orbit on August the 20th, 2019, and on September the 2nd, the lands of Vikram detached from the orbiter and descended to an altitude of 2.1 kilometers from the moon's surface. As it was about to gently float to ground level, a software glitch caused mission control to lose contact with Vikram, and the land appeared off course. Its fate remained unknown until NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter detected some scattered debris near the intended landing site. Both Vikram and the rover had failed. Not always lost, however, as the Chandrayaan-2 orbiter continued to do its job. Equipped with the highest resolution camera ever deployed in a lunar mission thus far, it will continue to snap and shoot well into the year 2026. Now, good sci-fi trilogies teach us that the second installment is usually the pinnacle of the franchise, but that's not always the case, and the second chapter is more often than not just the prelude to the grand finale. And that came in 2023, under the title of Chandrayaan 3. On August 23rd of that year, ISRO successfully landed its new craft on the lunar surface, deploying a small rover weighing 26 kilograms. This was designed to operate for 14 days and carried two payloads, a laser-induced breakdown spectroscope, or LIBS, intended to study the chemical and mineralogical makeup of the surface, and an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer to determine the elemental composition of soil and rocks around the landing site. In addition to these studies, the landing craft itself was equipped with four further payloads, collecting data on the thermal properties and structure of the moon's upper crust and mantle. Once again, ISRO proved that they could conduct successful space missions, on par with more established counterparts at a very low cost. According to Fizz.org, this can be achieved, quote, by copying and adapting existing technology and thanks to an abundance of highly skilled engineers who earn a fraction of their foreign counterparts' wages. In fact, the overall cost for Chandrayaan-3 was $75 million. To continue our theme of comparisons with Tinseltown, just the year before, Roland Emmerich, the master of disaster, had released Moonfall to the production budget of $146 million. It's 4.4 out of 10 on IMDb, by the way. Just a week after Chandrayaan-3 had success on September the 2nd, 2023, ISRO launched its next endeavor, the satellite craft Aditya L1. Those familiar with Hinduism may know that Aditya is one of the attributes of Surya, the solar deity, which points to the objective of this mission, studying the sun. More precisely, performing an analysis of coronal mass ejections, a periodic occurrence in which huge blasts of plasma and magnetic energy erupt from the solar atmosphere, potentially reaching Earth and disrupting the functioning of satellites. 
satellites. The end goal of the Aditya L1 satellite is to predict future coronal ejections early enough so that satellites can be temporarily shut down and then resume their operations. On January the 6th, 2024, Aditya L1 reached its destination, which is not exactly the sun, mind you, but somewhere much closer to home. A location of the Sun-Earth system known as the Lagrange Point 1, at approximately 1.5 million kilometers distant from our planet. This is where the gravitational forces of the Earth and the Sun are in perfect equilibrium, thus allowing for the craft to maintain a stable position. Aditya L1 will stay at the Lagrange Point 1 for the next five years, whilst collecting data with its seven locally designed and built payloads. Thus far, ISRO and the Department of Space have reached the Moon, Mars' orbit, and are in the process of unveiling the secrets of the Sun's coronal ejections. So what's next? A sequel to Mangalyan is scheduled for 2026, another orbital mission around the Red Planet, which may be followed by a proper landing in the near future. The Indian Space Agency has also initiated a joint project with its Japanese counterpart to develop another lunar probe by 2026, as well as a Venus orbiter by 2031. But how about manned missions? An Indian astronaut, Rakesh Sharma, already went to space in 1984, but this uh, was part of a Soviet trek. For an all-Indian expedition, we'll not have to wait very long. On February the 27th, 2024, ISRO chairman Dr. Sridhara P. Samanath announced that four Air Force pilots had been shortlisted for India's first space flight to take place in 2025. Three of them will be eventually selected for mission Gaganyan and spent three days at an orbit of 400 kilometers. At the time of preparing this episode, ISRO has successfully conducted safety tests and is about to conduct a dress rehearsal with a robotic crew. All the while, the human crew has been readying themselves at the astronaut training facility in Bengaluru, plowing through a curriculum which includes flight suit training, microgravity familiarization, aeromedical training, survival, and yoga, because you can't go into orbit with a bad back. If Gaganyan is a success, ISRO will launch into the next stages of its 2047 roadmap, which aims to achieve some pretty ambitious milestones by the year 2047, exactly 100 years after India gained independence. For context, China has a similar grand strategy for space, the 2049 roadmap. Note that 1949 is the year which modern communist China was founded. In other words, the two nations have embarked on a good old-fashioned space race, both aiming to outlaunch, outland, and outprobe each other before a date of immense symbolic importance. Who is more likely to win this contest in the long run? Well, we'll look at China's space program in detail in a separate episode, but Beijing appears to have the edge in certain fields, such as reusable space plane capability and solar power. Moreover, China was able to launch manned missions as early as 2003. But India's program does showcase the potential to quickly catch up. The next stage in ISRO's roadmap is delivering its space station by 2035, with a first unit to be finalized in 2028. The station will orbit at an altitude of 140 kilometers and will host at least three astronauts. Next, Indian astronauts plan to walk on the moon by 2040. This endeavor will be followed by more Chandrayaan missions, with the last one, number seven, aimed at building a permanent lunar infrastructure. In addition to these publicly funded enterprises, the Department of Space is looking to develop and support the Indian commercial space sector. To this end, the department has set up two new bodies, the New Space India Limited and the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center, better known as InSpace. Their aim is to support the private sector in growing the future competitive to the likes of SpaceX and Blue Origin, which sounds like a future private space race is on the horizon as well. The key element here is that were India to develop a cost-efficient commercial sector, ISRO itself would benefit from its services and potentially cut down on its annual budget of $1.8 billion, which is $1.8 billion more than you or I have, but it is ridiculously low compared to NASA's annual budget of $25.4 billion. As of March 2024, ISRO has conducted 96 launch missions and released into the cosmos 124 spacecraft a more than respectable tally achieved in record time. It appears that India still has to catch up with some of China's achievements and definitely with those of more established space agencies. But the outlook for RSRO appears positive. As Professor Namrata Goswami, a consultant for Space Fund Intelligence, wrote in an article for The Diplomat, given China's economic problems, India might be just constituted right to include its demographic dividend by the 2040s and talent pool to catch up quickly. But the outlook for RSRO appears very positive.